So in this video, we're going to be looking at erythrocyte sedimentation rate testing. In particular, we're going to be looking at at-home testing for ESR. So I had the opportunity to sit down with Bob Messerschmidt, the founder of Home ESR testing device that will be made available sometime in the next month or two, basically waiting for FDA approval for at-home ESR testing. The company name is called Core Health, and I'll put a link in the description where you can find out more about this. As I've discussed in the past, inflammation is an important variable to understand and track, whether it's for digestive health or diet changes. I think tracking and testing inflammation is very critical or important as a key tool for understanding what's going on with your health and getting to more of an optimal health state. Being able to do this at home makes it even more convenient and more likely that you're going to make correlations and understand things. At home testing can also be very useful too for those that don't have access to healthcare in general and those that really like to understand what's going on in their body on a week to week basis. I envision this being helpful in my practice to my patients as a way to help track progress as they progress through their treatments. Just as an example, I treat a lot of patients that have chronic health issues with unknown causes or unknown etiologies. Some patients have seen three, four, even five different doctors before coming to me. And I think this is kind of normal for integrative health in general. But the point being is they're without a diagnosis and moreover, a specific treatment plan that, that we know is going to help them. Their symptoms can range from high histamine mast cell type of symptoms to fatigue or even digestive problems. And that's just to say that it's not always clear what's going on with them and how all their symptoms or problems kind of fit together and are interconnected does become clearer the more testing and measurements and treatment trials we do, we can start to fit things together and see trends in what's going on. That may take months of data collecting. Being able to do that at home at key time intervals during treatment can definitely compress the time it takes from going to a vague gray diagnosis to a black and white clear picture. So sed rate is a great test for this because it is nonspecific and has a broad range of health conditions that may be affecting it. I did a recent video looking at CRP and IBS, and CRP does have a lot of overlap, as we discuss in this video, with sedimentation rate. So be sure to check those out, too, if you want more details on inflammation and tracking your health. Just a quick note before we jump into it, uh, the link in the description is not an affiliate link, and this is not an advertisement. As the device comes available and I'm able to play with it and really validate its usefulness, I may do further videos on this technology. For now, I hope you enjoy this video on at-home testing of inflammation via sedimentation rate with founder of Core Health, Bob Messerschmidt. Now for a quick disclaimer. Why don't we just start off by you introducing yourself and a little back, give a little background on yourself as well. Yeah. My name is Bob Messerschmidt. I am the founder of Core Health, and uh, we are working on a um, in-home ESR measurement. Um, and um, we are going to begin shipments of that in December. Uh, that's the plan. I'm a, uh, I'm a tech guy. I've been a serial entrepreneur my whole career. Um, and, you know, digital health really only over the past, uh, two decades, uh, got a long career, That's but, any, <laughs> but anyway, my, my background is in optics and spectroscopy. Um, so measuring things, I actually, my training is in biochemistry and then I gravitated into optics and spectroscopy as a way to measure biochemistry things. So I was at the university of Pennsylvania oh, okay. uh, for nice. biochemistry, um, my uh, my arc is uh, that I've always been a hardware guy, and I've always been interested in how to very cleverly get information by using light and optical means um, out of a sample, usually an intractable sample. So uh, the most recent part of my career has centered around humans as the as the subject for optical measurements. And that, that often has taken me in the direction of non-invasive technologies. So things where you can launch a beam of light across the skin barrier and measure something in tissue and then get some light back out. Um, so were you, 
Go ahead. Sorry to interrupt, but no, no. are you part of the Apple Watch? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, pulse oximetry is an example. And of course, the Apple Watch has pulse oximetry. Uh, I was at Apple from, uh, uh, well, uh, I joined uh, as a as a platform, a director of platform architecture in 2010. My interaction with Apple started two years before that when uh, Steve Jobs became interested in acquiring my company. Um, yeah. And so, uh, um, you know, they did. Apple acquired my previous company. I became a platform architect. And um, the uh, it was it's a product that is, uh, or a technology that's uh, still under wraps and not, not introduced. But while I was at Apple, I was asked to join the team that was working on this project that would become the Apple Watch. Um, and so I put a team together and we architected all of the uh, sensors that eventually have become part of the Apple Watch one by one. So we were the first group of people to see photoplethysmography. Uh, we were the first to see EKG, temperature, those of all, and uh, uh, pulse oximetry. All of those things are now part of the product. But yeah. we were we were not a product team. We were an early ideation team. We were... Uh, doing the exploratory sort of uh, sort of research on those things. Proof of concept kind of stuff, yeah. Yeah, kind of like if you if we were at Google, it would be like Google X. Yeah. A okay. much more famous sort of uh, development structure. But Apple has tons of these little tiger teams just like that, uh, where there's a sector expert, you know, my expertise being optics and spectroscopy, but, you know, it runs the gamut. You could have experts in uh, all kinds of different areas. Anyway, they needed an optics and spectroscopy guy on the Apple Watch. Uh, and I feel like that was, I mean, the project that they acquired for me will be great. Uh, but the work that I did on the Apple Watch was really quite fulfilling, obviously, because of, you know, now it's generating billions of dollars of revenue, which is kind of cool. Uh, and, you know, helping a lot of people track things. And fundamentally, yeah. I'm interested in tracking. I'm interested in bringing this vision, uh, this digital health. What it can do is it can help empower people by bringing, uh, you know, data more under people's own control, which I think is key to building uh, yeah. a self-efficacy. Yeah, yeah. You see, I see that you know, in the last year or so since I started really using more of the continuous glucose monitor, but that's also why I got excited about when you guys reached out about this test that you're developing, because uh, I think it has uh, similar, can have similar, if not even better impact on people's lives. So I agree. Um, I agree. Obviously, I agree. <laughs> so, um, but why did you uh, go in this direction to look at this particular product? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I became... Um... I became obsessed, might be the right word, uh, with inflammation uh, as kind of the underpinning of really, you know, why is why are chronic conditions so prevalent in society today? Uh, I mean, chronic diseases now consume, I think, something like eighty percent of all of our healthcare dollars. Uh, the the long term bad outcomes of of chronic conditions. So yeah. Um, you know, I, I became obsessed with the idea that inflammation really underpins almost all of it, including, uh, you know, including cardiovascular disease, uh, you know, uh, and the, the much more obviously uh, immune system related, uh, you know, disorders and so forth. So, um, you know, I thought we could do a lot by if we wanted sort of, you know, a God marker for you know the underpinning of all chronic disease i saw an opportunity to do that with an inflammatory marker and i started looking toward esr for that because uh well really for two reasons first because it's a very non specific marker and that sounds bad right it's bad in a in a diagnostics sense you can't really diagnose anything with esr yeah uh, or, or CRP, HSCRP is similar. It's not, it's not really specific, uh, right? Um, and uh, uh, ESR and, and CRP are highly overlapped. They're like, you know, the, the R value between ESR and CRP are quite 
uh, highly correlated, R value of 0.7 or something like that. Uh-huh. Um, and so quite high. And and so um, the ESR measurement I can bring to people in a home setting at a much lower cost. Um, and so uh, with with less instrumental complexity. So, uh, you know, that's that's why I've gone with uh, with ESR um, for the uh, for the for the measurement. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, great. I mean, I'm, I'm excited about this because uh, we do, I do see, you know, chronic inflammation in a lot of my patients, whether it's like unexplained neuropathy or blood sugar issues, high platelets, high CRP sometimes you just have this like subclinical autoimmune. So they're, they kind of present as if they have some kind of autoimmune thing, like Mm. aches and pains. But then when you do their uh, testing for autoimmune disease, nothing really shows up. And so we're sort of in this um, middle ground where they don't really have that. And then when it comes to treatment, the turnover time for seeing if something's going to help. I mean, people are going to come in maybe every two months or maybe every month if you're really aggressive, but no one's going to go in for a blood test like multiple times a week. Uh, Very rarely are we going to do that because of costs and just the inconvenience. So yeah, a lot of times I'm focusing on gut related things or diet related things or different supplements. And uh, part of the difficulty is getting some kind of validation of those treatments. Yes. exactly. Um, So if you're doing like a SIBO treatment or something like, uh, which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, that test will run somewhere from 200 to $300. And that's sort of a, a big barrier for people to do even every two months, just because yes. of the cost. Yes. So, um, so oftentimes I find myself running inflammatory markers, but they're not always correlated either. But, you know, it could be also that we're not capturing the uh, ups and downs of what's happening throughout the treatment process. So, right. Um, so I think this can be very useful. Yeah. Yeah. I told you I come from the tech world and, you know, the, the sort of the tech community, the, the vision there is that eventually, com- you know, wearable solutions are going to be enough, you know, for the, you know, for giving this feedback that, that you and I are both seeking. Um, and uh, I haven't seen it yet. I haven't seen the wearable technologies, the completely non-invasive technologies being able to provide, you know, enough ro- a robust enough data set for the sorts of things you're looking at, you're seeing in your, in your patients. Um, yeah. It's still lab tests um, that are offering the most insight, I think. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, you know, we're focused on bringing a few of those uh, lab tests into the, into the home, you know, bending the cost curve so that you can do it frequently. So the you know the thing about the thing about the tech solution, the wearable solution is you that is clearly trackable, right? Because you have continuous data. Um, you know, but you know, but it's stuff like heart rate variability or resting heart rate and things like that, right? Yeah, I was going to ask you about the heart rate variability piece actually as it relates to this because it's supposed to be like a stressor on the body and uh but the that's not like a moment to moment kind of thing either you have to be still or there seems to be like a lot of um things that can interfere with it and it's fairly complex but i think that may have some potential uh in the long run if it gets a little more accurate but uh, that's what i was curious to ask you about yeah i would just agree with you on that i i mean i think i really like heart rate variability from what I've seen. And it's really just, I've only looked at anecdotal data. I haven't seen a big study yet. Um, but I, the anecdotal data that I've seen is that, uh, you can, you know, see events that have, you know, that are, that have happened or, uh, or are about to happen. Yeah. Uh, and, and in a very non-specific way. So I, I brought up HRV because it is analogous to ESR, I think, and it's, non-specificity yeah uh, it's uh you know it's it's tracking something i mean resting heart rate is i think similar right in that uh was i had last week 
Um, I actually had a, uh, I've never had any problems with my gallbladder before in my life. I had a gallbladder attack. And uh, so I'm, you know, I'm routinely testing my ESR and I thought, oh, this will be interesting to, uh, to see whether I see a spike in my ESR after this gallbladder attack. And sure enough, there was a huge spike. Oh. Um, and, uh, you know, th then I was browsing through my Apple health pages and my resting heart rate showed a, showed a similar, I mean, I say spike, but it was up and then back down, right. And both the yeah. ESR and, uh, and on the resting heart rate. Yeah. So yeah, it's a it's a non-specific, but it's also it is probably a little more specific to the immune it, system and inflammation in general. It, sorry, yeah, it is specific to inflammation, I believe. Uh, it it actually has, uh, from what I read in the literature and talking to people, it uh, reflects more inflammatory pathways even than does uh, CRP. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I think it's a it's a really useful test, and um, I, like I say, I use it uh, routinely in my practice too. So along those lines, let's talk about like how your test actually works and, and like what it actually is measuring. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, erythrocyte sedimentation rate is uh, looking for a cartridge here. Let me just grab one. So. We provide a cartridge like this, which is a single-use uh, consumable, and uh, it's a piece of plastic. And inside here, um, there's a there's a capillary tube, mm -hmm. which is you know you'll recognize this as a microhematocrit tube. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, what you do is you take this tube and you. We provide a handy, handy dandy little device here to to lay the tube down in. So now you have two hands free okay. to you know get a drop of blood, squeeze your finger a little bit to get a drop of blood, hold it up to the plastic tube, and fill that tube with with a with a bit of blood. And that's it's about thirty microliters that you need, which is you know less than a less than a drop of blood. Oh, okay. Um, so it's a tiny amount of blood. Um, the um, and then you you uh, sedimentation rate is really exactly like it sounds. Erythrocyte sedimentation rate. Erythrocytes for your audience are uh, red blood cells, and if you leave a column of whole blood, just uh, vertical and you know uh, under the force of gravity the red blood cells separate from the plasma and start dropping to the bottom of the tube. Right. And someone in the 1800s uh, <laughs> discovered that, that that rate of falling was in fact related to inflammation. So that's what's called the erythrocyte sedimentation rate. And you can yeah. just, you just measure it. Um, yeah. And uh, it's faster. So your red, the red blood cells fall faster, primarily in the in the face of uh, chronic inflammation or well, any inflammation. And um, that's primarily for two reasons. Uh, one is uh, when you have an inflammatory process, the red blood cells tend to uh, get stickier, and they uh, they stick together. So you can think of that, and you know, if from the cardiovascular implications of that, right? If you're if you've got something in your blood now that's sticky, it's going to be possible to produce plaques and plaques. You know, bad things, right? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so the red blood cells clump together. That makes them heavier in the aggregate, so they fall faster. Um, the other thing that happens is, uh, and it's uh, really these both of these things work in the same direction. When fibrinogen is high in the plasma, the red blood cells also fall faster and Fibrinogen is another independent marker of inflammation. So, so fibrinogen is a protein that's produced in the liver, just as uh, C-reactive protein (CRP) is a is a protein produced in the liver. And fibrinogen, CRP, and ESR all overlap quite a bit. They're all highly correlated. Yeah. Um, so, so when fibrinogen is high and red cells clump more. You get an uh, an increased sedimentation rate, and that's just what we measure. And we provide a tracking of that in the you know in a, in an app, so you can 
see what your results are over time. You can try to correlate those with things you're doing in your lifestyle. Yeah, very nice. Um, and do you see any difference? Uh, so this is like a um, tissue, more of a tissue sample versus a venous blood sample. Is there going to be much yeah. variation there? Uh, the, the, there is not very much variation. I mean, there's some, I mean, they, there's going to be a standard sort of, um, you know, the, the, the literature on this blood test is probably the error bars. The standard error is, you know, maybe 10 to 20% measurement to measurement. Okay. Uh, but there's a lot of contrast in this test. So when you see an ESR spike, it's should be above that noise floor. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, during our correspondence too, we were talking a little bit about reference range differences, age dependency, and uh, yeah, I thought that was uh, really helpful and interesting because yeah, a lot of times my patients in particular and some of the stuff I tr try to present on the YouTube channel is more so about optimal levels of health and not just are you average or the, the averages based yeah. on like the whole population who's presumed to be healthy, but in our population these days, a lot of, a lot of people are not that healthy. And so something for optimal health is always important to look at. So do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Yeah. This, this really caught my attention specifically about the ESR marker. Um, and it, but it's true for any lab marker for any normal range, normal ranges of lab tests generally were set by looking at the measurement across a population of people uh, and uh, then defining a 95% range as normal and a 5% range as not normal. So the normal range is really just calculated statistically from a population. Uh, and so for ESR, there's a population normal that tends to rise with age so the uh, the, the 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 normal uh, the average esr value drifts up with age it, it does for crp too uh, but it's really it's fairly dramatic for esr so that you know i scratched my head about that because i didn't understand why that needed to be true right so yeah, just yeah. like you're saying with optimal range and it turns out there are studies in the literature where they excluded people from the study population who had overt disease states. And if you study really just healthy people and look at any look for an age dependence of the ESR measurement, it's not there. It's completely gone. Yeah. So so the you don't, you know, the the uh the the, the medical allowable level of ESR for me, for example, as a kind of an older male, I would be allowed to have an ESR as high as 30 millimeters per hour. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, if I, if I were a young person, it would be, it was supposed to be under 10. And so, uh, but, but like I say, the, the optimal, I would say the optimal is under 10. Um, yeah. some people even say under six, right. Um, my, my ESR is, uh, is three. Um, so I, and I've done that through, uh, um, diet, um, and also various, uh, superfoods that I've come to learn what really works for me by, you know, by, by using the device, um, uh, there's, so they're. There are certain things that work for me that I that I don't expect will work for everyone. Right. Yeah, that's kind of, I mean, uh, similar to continuous glucose monitor. Like, yeah. There's obvious things that are, you know, potentially going to be helpful, like don't eat sugar. But then when it comes to like, you know, more specific carbohydrates, one person may respond differently than another person. And yeah, it's yes. really, I think that can be really yeah. helpful in, you know, really getting into like personalized medicine, which is, um, you know, it's, that's probably, you know, where a lot of things are leading through looking at genetics yes. and more availability of testing. And, you know, it's just going to allow us to get individualized, individually optimized uh, results and treatments and things like that. So, yeah, totally, I totally agree.
Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think, uh, we got a, a pretty good background on, you know, what the test does and, and, uh, why it's useful and you're obviously well qualified to create something like this. And it sounds like it's going to be FDA approved here pretty soon. Right. And that's when you're going to start making the test available. So where will people go to, to get this test? Yeah, it's not on the market yet. We still have to go through that regulatory process. Um, the, um, but uh, this is, I forgot to put up the device itself looks like this. So it's uh fairly nice looking thing that you can, you know, leave out on a counter in your bathroom uh, or your office, wherever you want to do this testing is fine. Um, it's got a uh, power port here, which is just a USB connector. Uh, it connects to your home Wi-Fi, So it sends the data up to the cloud. And then we return a message to you after 30 minutes with the, uh, with the data result. Okay. Um, we're selling it. We're 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 we're, we're uh, taking uh, filling a wait list right now, uh, so you can go to our website and you can sign up for the wait list, and that's the best way to get one of these soon is to be on the wait list. We'll you know we'll work through that in order. Um, the uh, the website is uh, corehealth.com. C O R H E A L T H. So there's no e, just corehealth. Okay. Uh, dot com and um, um, it'll be, it's just a landing page where you'll see a sign up for the wait list. It'll be pretty obvious. Okay. I'll put a link to that in the description of this video. Oh, great. As well. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah, I think I, I would definitely encourage people to check this out if they're dealing with chronic, uh, inflammatory issues, microinflammation, or, or just chronic health issues that are unexplained because the immune system often does get involved with that. And it's just not that you're going to, you know, be able to diagnose, but you can track some of the things that you're doing and whether or not things are improving your health as you move forward with your treatments or possibly going the other direction. So I think this is uh, going to be a, a real game changer. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you. It was a, it was a great, uh, great discussion. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, I guess we'll correspond more. Yeah. Anybody who's on that uh wait list. We're sending out periodic updates. Uh, there's been one update already and uh, you know more to come. Okay, great. Well, thanks for your time and thanks for making this available to everyone. Great. Thank you. I appreciate Robert. your work. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Bye now. Bye-bye.